Jubilee. Jubilee. Good to see you this morning. Glad to be together in the house of the Lord. It was great. I got to spend time with my family out in the woods all week. And anytime any of us left, my little granddaughter would go, where's my family? Where's my family? And that's how I felt when I got back here this morning. I'm like, here's my family. I just am so glad to be with you guys. So... There's no place I'd rather be except worshiping our king with some of the most beautiful saints in the world. I bless you. I bless you this morning. I bless each and every one of you. You are loved by God. And you are here today by his divine ordinance, by his divine plan. You could be anywhere else today, but today he brought you here to be together in this moment with all the saints across the world, but for right now with Jubilee. Hey, online peeps, you as well. We're so grateful you're with us right now. We're gonna just come and glorify our King. We're gonna magnify him in his largeness, in his grace, in his beauty, in his power, and in his truth, and in his word. So let's just bring our hearts right now And any concerns that may have followed you into this building or into this time online. And I'm inviting you to just take all of those concerns and say, Lord, I'm going to sacrifice that. I'm going to set it at your feet and I'm going to determine that in this moment you are the most important thought I could have. I'm going to fix my gaze on you. I'm going to set my thoughts on you, the Lord of lords and the King of kings. I exalt you in this moment, oh God. Come have your way in each one of us that as we worship you, as we declare who you are, all the rest of the world will grow strangely dim. Let us step inside of Christ in his love right now. Let us be present with the one. He is worthy of all praise. Thank you, God. Thank you right now for this moment. Just tell him, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that I'm right here right now. For every miracle that we are aware of and every miracle we are not aware of, thank you. May your presence come and minister healing as we minister praise, exaltation, and worship to you, O God. In the name of Jesus, the Messiah, we pray. Amen. And now our shofar team is going to call us into worship. I'm 
Savior Because you heal my heart You change my name Forever free I'm not the same I thank the Master I thank the Savior I thank God I cannot deny what I've seen Got no choice but to believe My doubts are burning Like ashes in the wind So, so long to my old friends Burden and bitterness You can just keep it moving You ain't welcome here Now till I walk the streets of gold I'll sing of how you saved my soul This wayward soul has found its way back home Because you pick me up, turn me around Place my feet on solid ground I thank the Master, I thank the Savior Because you heal my heart, you change my name
because you picked me up and turned me around. Place my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior because you heal my heart.
faith might fail God but you remain faithful always to your word Lord you are always faithful to your word I may not understand the timing because I tend to look up from down here but you are the end from the beginning you see it all and you know every moment so forgive me, God. Forgive me for any time where I'm like, where are you? Why aren't you being faithful, God? Because in that moment, I'm the one not being faithful. So would you fill me again with faith that I may be faithful, God? Because you never change and you're always right. <laughs> you're always right, God. You're always good. You're always faithful. Your word is true and it never changes, Lord. I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God of the goodness of God 
Jubilee. You can be seated. We're going to go ahead and receive, get prepare our hearts to receive tithes and offerings this morning. And I just wanted to share a quick minute. I'll try to be brief, but uh, don't want to take time away from pastor and the anointing. So a couple of weeks ago on The Secret Place, pastor wrote, he wrote the title was, Why I Tithe. Does anybody remember that one? Okay, good. There's a, you should read it. Because when I read it, I, I read it, and the first question I had was, why do I tithe? And it caused me to think for a minute, which I think is a good place to be, you know, to, again, consider a thought. Why do I, why do I tithe? And immediately, God brought me back to a season in mine in Veda's life. We were young much younger than now. We had four kids. Our life was totally in debt. I mean, a lot of debt. You know, mostly because of my bad choices. But that's the way life is when you're young. You don't know you're making bad choices till you get out of them and realize that you can look back on them. But I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about me. And I remember a scripture was Proverbs 22, 7. If anybody knows it, it says that the debtor is slave to the lender. And I remember saying, God, I want to be your servant, but I can't because I'm slave to another. My debt holds me in bondage to not be able to give in a manner that you want me to in a manner in which I want to. So I went to God and I started praying and asking him to rescue me from my debt. Anybody pray that prayer? In the midst of it, God showed me. I asked him for a word to help me so that I could, so I could maneuver and manage my way out of or in the season I was in. And he gave me 1 Samuel 14, 6. And it's when Jonathan was talking with his armor bearer. And basically he says that nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. See, nothing restrains God. Nothing can restrain him. So in the midst of my debt, in the midst of my, the, the, the weight of it, I, I heard the Lord say that he could save me by many or by few. And I immediately knew what he was saying. He wasn't saying he was going to send an army to rescue me or that I was going to have to do it alone. But he could save me by many payments or by few payments. But he would save. You know? So out of that place, I had determined that I, I, could, not, I could not tithe. I could not give to the Lord because the money was not mine. It was somebody else's. And so I had to make a decision. So I told God out of Genesis 28, when Jacob, after he, he has the dream of the ladder of the going up and the angels coming up and going down, and he realizes he's in a holy place, he makes a statement. Let me find it here. It's verse um, 20, Genesis 28, 20. It says, then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and keep me in this way, 
that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothes to put on so that I will come back to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God and this stone which I have as a pillar shall be God's house and all that you give me I will surely give a tithe or a tenth to you. So I told God, I said, I can't give you what doesn't belong to me, but I can give from you. I can give a tenth out of everything you give me as increase from this point on. And so I remembered, I would get extra jobs. I worked hourly at the time and I would take overtime. And any overtime I took, I gave him a, I gave him a tithe. Anytime he'd give me an extra job, send me out and do something extra, go help someone, and they paid. I gave tithe of it, and I told God, I'd be faithful with what little I had that was mine so that, so that he could bless it, okay? And in the process, of course, we paid down the debt. We paid down the debt. We paid down the debt. It wasn't mine. It was a debt I had to take care of. So... All that to be said, long story short, yes, it took, it, it was, it was a, a, a freedom by many payments. It didn't come in few. I never won the lotto. I never played the lotto, so that was going to be a bigger miracle. But yeah, yeah. I mean, it would have been a good miracle. But if you don't play, you probably aren't going to win. And I'm not saying to play. That's, that's your conscience, not mine. <laughs> right? But God rescued, and God was faithful, and God brought us through, right? And he brought us, he brought us back into our Father's house in peace and that. So I say all that to say I tithe because God's faithful. He's faithful, even like that song. Even when I'm not, God's faithful. He's held. He's never walked away. He's never walked away. I've walked away. I've failed, but he's never failed. So I tithe because God's faithful and complete and because he does rescue, does bring us out, brought me out. So um, all that to be said is I wanted to kind of give everybody, because we're family, right? Right? That's why we're here. You, you don't, you don't, you're, you're here because you're family. You're part of this tribe we call Jubilee. Right? So, I wanted to kind of fill everybody in on where we're at. As of the end of June of uh, this year, we were $62,000 in, in the red. And I don't say that to make anybody give anything that you didn't already purpose in your heart to give. I say that because what I want is I want us to agree that God is faithful and that God can rescue us like he rescued us, Veda and I, and that he's rescued all of us together, right? Because Malachi 3 says in verse 6, it says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Yet from that day, from the days of your father, you have gone away from my ordinances and you have not kept them. And then he says, return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even the whole nation. Then verse 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food or meat or substance in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, that you cannot even contain it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, so that you do not, so that you're, so he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor the vine shall not bear fruit 
in its field, says the Lord of hosts. See, God's desire for, the, that's, that's always been my prayer. God, I'm going to bring the tithe in. You're going to rebuke the devourer. You're going to take care of my fields. You're going to take care of my stuff. I'm going to do my, my little part. You're going to do your part. But it's also a corporate prayer because he was talking to a nation, to a people. And so it's my prayer that today that we would come into agreement that God will, will come in into this house, which means for him to come into this house corporately, he comes into all of our houses, okay? And rescues and brings in and helps and rebukes devourers and takes all that away. That we would come into a place where, where, where God would then come in and rescue. And just an interesting little tidbit from it all because Wednesday we were having our intercession workshop and we were in here and uh, if you were here, you'll, you'll remember because it was 80 degrees here in the sanctuary with all the air conditioning on. And we realized that after worship, after, you know, that, that we ended up moving into the other room because the air conditioners weren't working. So I spent the afternoon while everybody was back praying and, and interceding. I spent up on the roof with the air conditioner guy and, and we got, thankfully, we have air this morning because he's faithful in that. But I kind of wanted to, again, just fill in everybody that, that, that there's those units on the roof were here since 19... We put them in in 1998. Okay? For some of you, that's, those units are older than you. You know? And that. And uh, they're working good. But the one on the end, on that end, is, is failing for lack of other terms. These ones are still functioning. We got, them, we got new parts and repaired them and that, but that one's uh, needs some more diagnosis, you know. So I wanted to let everybody know that, that that's another place that we need, we need to be believing God for. Not only to take, take care of what, what the, the dead, but also to bring us enough increase so that we can take care of those things that are still ahead of us. Okay? So, I'm just, again, I'm telling you all this because we're family. Right? Because if you don't know, you can't pray. Right? You can't believe and trust God. So, will you guys do that with me? Would you? Because see, when I, when I think of agreement, if I tell you I'm going to agree with you, I'm going to agree that God's going to meet you. But I'm also going to keep it in my forefront. I'm going to keep it in my, on my lips. Your problem, because it's not your problem anymore, because I agreed, now it's my problem. So I'm asking you to help us and to pray and to trust God and believe that God's going to come through because he's faithful. He can only complete what he started. He can only complete it. Okay? Just, he, it never is a point where he's not going to. Okay? So can you agree with me? All right. Well, let's pray, and then we can bring up the tithes and the offerings. Heavenly Father, I thank you today. I thank you that above everything, you are faithful. You are faithful, and you are doing exceedingly abundantly above more than we can ask or think. And I thank you, Father, that, that we do not fully understand how you move and what you do and how you how you make things work, and how you rescue and save. But Father, I want to thank you today that you would come into every home in Jubilee and you would come today, this week, this month, the month of June, as, we, as we're in the middle of our summer, Lord, that you would come in and rescue into every home. That you would come in and, and, and you would lift financial burdens. Father, and the only way I know that personally that you're going to lift financial burdens to start is you're going to speak to us because your word is more valuable than silver or gold so father i'm thanking you that you're going to speak to jubilee you're going to speak to each person in the midst of the trials the tribulations the circumstances and situations so that they hear your voice and that they know it's you and that then they can hold on they can apply their faith 
to your word and your character and who you are, Lord, and then they can, they can withstand and hold fast in believing. So I thank you for that, Lord. And we do that as a corporate body, as this family called Jubilee. We believe, God, that you are more than able to do exceedingly more for this house for these people, Father, to come in, to cancel all debts, to bring us forward, to get us, um, to get us further along in, in into a better place, Lord, because that's what your desire is to bless. So we now return. We return, Father. In all places, we return our hearts first. First our hearts, then our finances, then our service. We return them all to you, Jesus, and say, we need you. We want your way, not our way. And we thank you for it all, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You can go ahead and bring your tithes and offerings up. If you're online, you can go ahead and give. Go to the Jubilee button on the website and give online. You can text and give it tithely through the text messages. This mountain can't be moved They say these chains will never break But they don't know you like we do There is power in your name We've heard that there is no way through will never change they haven't seen what you can do there is power in your name so much power in your that empty grave God we believe no matter what God, we believe, yes, God, we believe for 
sincerity of heart we return to you it is in faith that we declare you are more than able to perform what you promised therefore the devourer is rebuked the windows of heaven are being opened and blessings are poured out in new ways and beyond us and we thank you for the glory of your house having bread in it and every household in your house having bread and that inflation not conflicts of nations not wars and rumors of war will stop your faithfulness and your ability and your grace and your goodness to find us all the days of our life in Jesus glorious name amen amen yay well, take a moment, please. Go greet one or two, three people. Speak a good word. Let them know that God is faithful, doing a good thing. And God bless you guys online. It's just a joy to be together. I, I had a thought. Now, when we are come together in the, in the spirit, we come with intentionality. And um, I just want to suggest that where you are, in service with at home or later in another day give your best to the lord intentionally intentionally with attention to receive and to be uh, uh ready to come into that encounter so whatever the lord directs whatever's happening stay engaged with us because that's how faith brings us into the receiving posture we believe and therefore we continue and then we come into that encounter. So I'm blessing you. I, I see some miracles, breakthroughs, graces, joy. Um, there's a joy coming into your home. There's peace that's going to surround you and guard your heart and your mind. And there's a kingdom of God. His righteousness, peace, and joy in Holy Spirit is there where you are. And he's going to rest and come really large upon you today. So get ready. Pull and receive. Okay. If, <clears throat> now we'll pull people. Okay, now if I can pull everybody back. <clears throat> Go ahead, Chris, come on up. I'd like you to... <clears throat> Our big Wednesdays... 
Intercession continues uh, 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. Then we have our dinner at 5 p.m. We have two more of our dinners, so please come out and join us. Also, two more classes of School of Intercession. They've been profound. Delin has done an excellent job. It has been a joy to have you pull us forward. And it's been good to have Karen with us for a week. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, we will also have Superbook Olympics. It's good to have the Mahanos. Stephen, welcome home. Good to see you well and recovering in Jesus, Lord. So you'll be able to serve now again with the young ones this Wednesday. Bless you. So then uh, what's coming up? Yeah. Well, one, one, one other thing. This Tuesday, uh, the Camarillo Healing Rooms, led by Wes, will do a worship night at 6.30 to 8.30. Is that correct? 6.30 to 8.30? Right. So worship, you want another night of worship, then Friday night comes, and we've got our Friday night fire, which is worship and prayer and miracles and altar ministry. So we're going to have a full week, and then Saturday's coming. Yeah. Yeah, Saturday is coming. It will be fun. <clears throat> But I wanted to just tell you a quick little story. As I was out of town for a couple of weeks with my family, we go up to a lake as an extended family. And it was a Friday afternoon or evening, and um, we're all having fun, like we do in life. We have fun. But my brother walked out onto the deck. It was dusk, and he has his shofar. And in the midst of everyone having fun, we stopped. And we listened while he blew the shofar across the land and how it echoed off the mountains. And we heard the reverberation of it coming back upon us. It was a sign for us and for me anyway that there is a God. And he loves it when we stop what we're doing and praise him. And that's what we're going to do this Saturday is we're going to take time to have fun with the Son of God. We're going to praise him, yes, and we're going to honor him, yes. Because that's what they did. We look at the Old Testament, and that's what they did. They praised and honored and, and thanked him. And then they went and had fun. And that's what we're going to do, ladies. So please sign up for Saturday. It's this Saturday coming up, 10 o'clock here. We'll start in the sanctuary. And then lunch will be afterwards. You can sign up online or see Joyce back there. But it's going to be a time to stop for just a moment and say thank you, Lord, because you are so important in our lives. Yes, Lord. Yes, Amen. Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Uh, the following Saturday, which will be, I believe, the third. No, it'll be like the 11th. Is men, we will meet together for our inheritance, and we'll meet at 7.30 in the morning. We start with breakfast. I learned the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. So come. It's the best breakfast you'll have in Camarillo. And I, then we'll go into the sanctuary 8 o'clock, and we're done by 9.30. And it's an important gathering because it's the, we will not have a gathering in uh, September or October because our fall is, is filled with some, I believe, strategic and sovereign callings. First off... A week uh, in uh, September on the 14th, that Saturday, which would normally be our inheritance, will be a freedom encounter. Steve and Shirley Kwan, Restoration Ministries, are gathering to do a whole day Saturday to bring us into the le legal freedom that Jesus Christ has accomplished so that the truth can make us free. And it's a great way of disengaging from any of the unclean things that may have occurred to you, in you, through you, past seasons. It's just a, it's a perfect thing to begin doing. The following um, 21st, so a week then from the following Sunday, is our 40th anniversary, which is huge. I, I, I'm, God's getting really excited about it. I am... I'm excited about it. I-40 always has a finishing one to enter into the new. Uh, we will have to, we'll be together, and then we'll have a meal together out, again, out in the parking lot, because it'll still be a beautiful, warm, sunny day. Forty years ago, I started the church. Cammie and I did. We had two children. 
We started at a pizza parlor, and uh, we didn't know anything. In fact, I was so caught up in myself, I didn't even realize it was my mom's birthday. But she was the one who prayed to send me into the kingdom, and her prayers got, brought me into face-to-face with Jesus Christ. And she was there on that first Sunday and continued all the way until she could no longer uh, um, come travel, and then she's now in heaven watching through the portal. I'm sure she is. In any case... Uh, Lots have happened, and we're going we're gonna to celebrate and take hold of, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Then comes October, the first Sunday of Oct- Saturday of October, the ladies' ministry will come back bringing Clarice Fluid. Yeah, if anybody who's ever had her, sat within her ministry, you know there's a lot of grace, a lot of authority, a lot of power, and uh, she carries supernatural uh, unctions, and so that's a Saturday. Then on the... Um, I think there might be something else in between there, but on the 18th, 19th, and 20th, which is the Feast of Tabernacles, the Sukkot, the last of the seven feasts, we're going to bring Larry Napier to come and speak into the high priestly ministry of Melchizedek, of our Lord Jesus, so that we might mature into the perfect man and into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. It's, uh, I'll be talking a lot about... The, the, the dream that God's given me, and I believe it's the dream God gave our Lord Jesus, of the maturity of the church, of the glorification of the church in Christ. So we're going to we have a full fall, and it's, it's going to be very, very perfect and powerful. So having said all that, let me go to my notes. And then um, let's go to Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. I won't have to take a long time today. It was just really good. Brian, thank you for doing that. Brian wouldn't tell you that, but he spent the entire next day on the roof. And it was Rosie Bates' husband, Dan Bates, who was the one who installed the AC, and, and they spent, had good fellowship in the hot sun. <laughs> I noticed you got a little bit of tan there. <laughs> um, we are... Right before the Lord in an opportune time, I believe in the Spirit. Uh, I will tell you, let me go to... Okay, thank you. Everything he's talked to me in his last few days, I heard in the prayer room or in the worship or in in the uh, declarations of others praying and speaking and singing. So I'm going to take us to Matthew 13 for a point of reference. Uh, It is the parable of the last days. And because of that, in verse 30, it's first Jesus shares the parable, as he often did. He shares the parable in chapter 13 at verse 24. And then he continues on into some other parables. Then in verse 36, which we're going to take up, his disciples say, Oh, Scott Finfrock, before you you, uh, leave today, you got to come up and see me. I have a picture of you back from our family camp. It's funny, we're, we are, without planning because of the anniversary, we've had since we moved out of our big house in Camarillo, like seven big old plastic tubs of pictures. And at one time, we had hoped to get all the kids and say, just go for it, find what you want, and, and we'll digitize it, do whatever. That didn't happen because of just a rapid way we had to move from Cammie's dad's house into the apartments we live at the beach now. And so we stored them up at Nathan's, and he put them after it took too long to not do anything with them in the garage, as we all do. He kind of put it up into the attic, and then recently he, went, he had to bring that all out of the attic, and so it was now in our living room, <laughs> which it needed to be. And, I, we, and we have no storage. We got rid of 80 90% of all our belongings when we sold the house. And now this was the last thing to deal with. So Cammie said, I don't think we're going to have time. We have all the kids coming up for a surf camp and during the fair, since we live right next to the fair. And so we'll be being together, but it's a lot of grandkids and a lot of movements. So we, Cammie said, I want you to go, let's go through the pictures ourselves and separate the ones that would go to Nathan or to Christy or to Heidi or to Jenna or to David. And then the ones that include the family, we'll digitize those, but let everybody else just have their photos. So we've started that yesterday in earnest. 
And I'm thinking, wow, there's, there's all these different photos of us being as a church. And, and, young, and there's a picture of Scott Finbrock, who was our first official stand-up Scott, so everybody can see when they can rejoice in the contrast. He was a part of another church. God sent him here the first Sunday, or the second Sunday. You couldn't get here the first. And he was the man who became the keeper of all our stuff, because we were meeting in a banquet hall. Therefore, he had our PA system. He had uh, basically our PA system and an over, overhead projector. Anybody old enough to remember what an overhead projector is? A little plastic box, and the light shines and shoots up on the screen. Well, yeah, he would take all of that home and put it in his garage, and then every Sunday morning he'd put it all back in his truck and bring it um, to the church. And I know I've told you this story, but one time they... He was making a sharp turn, or a sharp turn was making him, but the overhead took off and didn't go with the turn and landed on the, and landed on the street. It, but it didn't break. See, that's, again, the best blessings of a tither is things don't wear out. And sometimes they do protect you. Anyway, I was, we, that was our first official heave offering. So Scotty's been a part of us, and so I'm just, I'm just pulling up all these funny pictures that I'm not going to keep because... This is a time for us to now put behind us the journey of our life, to celebrating it, giving God, because there's so much right now in front. And, and we're having a good time doing that. And we're gonna, so you may see some of these pictures that we kind of find over the next few weeks. So uh, let's go to if, if Matthew chapter 13, verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away. And he went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. He's giving us now the, the principles of this parable, who they are, what they represent. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. This is the parable Jesus gave to describe the end of the age, a very important parable. He says, therefore, the tares are gathered and burned in fire, and so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness. And he will cast them into the furnace of fire, and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The part of the, ter the parable that was not uh, explained uh, re-emphasized because it was the question when in the initial sharing the story uh, the servants of the one who had sown the field with good seed when they saw the tares growing they said well didn't you just sow good seed he said yeah but my enemy has sown the bad seed and we said well do you want us to go tear pull the tares out and he says no let them grow together because if you start trying to pull those weeds out you're going to damage some of the, of the good wheat. So that's why it, things keep growing. So there's two things that I, I believe are really important to, to know. Everyone's talking about the great harvest. According to the Lord Jesus, the great harvest is the maturity, the maturity of the sons of light and the maturity of of darkness and destruction. And when they have met the maturity, then he says it's harvest time. You don't harvest before it's mature. So what is really uh, affecting who we are, where we are, and what's about to happen is our maturing as a, as a body of believers, as sons of light coming out of babyhood and returning continually. Recently, as we're reading through the Bible, again, tomorrow we'll do a new podcast. There's the, there's the things of the scripture are so, so precious. I could do the whole message today just in the best, uh, chapters where I read this morning. But um, 
in this moment of time, in the maturing of the saints, there's, there's this, um, there's, there's something of the Lord that I feel compelled to, and I've been feeling this for 13, 14 years, that I want to give to our Father the reward of his inheritance in the saints. I want to see the church of the Lord Jesus come into perfection, which means completeness, so that Jesus can come and receive his bride. He's not going to come for a baby bride. Uh, in, he's coming for a matured, consummate bride. You'll hear that from Clarice. Um, I want to see the work that the Lord gave me to be done and complete. And it's, we'll, we're going to get into this. This is why I'm bringing Larry Napier to talk about having uh, a relationship inside of like the book of Hebrews concerning this high priestly ministry. When we went through Judges just a few weeks ago, <clears throat> it again came to my face and all of, the, all of the Old Testament are pictures and shadows and the beginning prophetic imagery that would be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so Israel is, is a picture. When they come into the promised land, it's given to them as an inheritance by lot. We read the story in uh, uh, Joshua as they start to make conquest and took out nation upon nation, city upon city, city kingdoms. Back then it was city kingdoms that ruled and territories. But they, they stopped toward the end of the uh, judges, or excuse me, Joshua, he's old. He's saying, you guys, you've left a lot of this. You've got to go get it. And we go into Judges. We hear a little bit of their acquiring some more of the promised land. But they failed to. Once they failed to continue taking their inheritance in full possession, they began to, make, they began to just become a part of the rest of the peoples. And they began to pick up their idolatry. They began to pick up their mindset, their culture. And soon they began to desert God for the culture of the land to which they had been given possession of, not because of their righteousness, but because of the wickedness of the land God was judging. So what happens is, uh, well, we just go through the book of Judges, the cycles of apostasy. Then we can now, we're right now, learn, right today, we're reading about Samuel anointing Saul to be a king. What's struck me, because everything I read, I know it's to be about Jesus Christ, and the promises, all promises were made to him, and all promises were fill, fulfilled in him, and all promises will be realized inside of him. And so, it dawned on me, this is a question, I can't prove it, but it's a question. Can our unwillingness, laziness, lack of interest, not desiring to become or come into all that Jesus Christ has accomplished, be as Israel, not taking possession of the promised land, leaving parts of the world in us, parts of our, and thereby, because we're not matured, we are in a position where he has to wait another generation. Don't think that there's the timetable of God is held, held to a calendar. It's not a calendar when it comes to God. It's the state of what he's preparing. The harvest of the end of the ages is when the harvest is ripe. And lawlessness is abounding. Love may be decreasing because of it. But beloved, 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 I know that I know that I know that God's Holy Spirit and his living word are working intentionally to bring a sanctification, activation, consecration into the glory of Jesus Christ. And, I, uh, and it, it's happening. It will happen. Uh, first time I uh, met, uh, I know, <laughs> I'm just such a blessed man because I've been given since I was the youngest. I think we got married, Kim and I, uh, I was 23, she was 21, and we were put into a four-square church, and, and we were in, enveloped with all kinds of Pentecostals and Charismatics that were twice or three times our age, and we just, 
they, they loved on us because we were young and we were dumb. And yet we had anointing, but we were young and dumb. I mean, that's just the way. And, oh, we just gleaned. It's like Rosie Bates, who got to live with her mom, Dodie Everest, who when she was a young woman, she would play the Hammond organ at the Dodger Stadium because back then they still played a hymn before we had a baseball game. So she'd been in all of these moves. Uh, on Wednesday, I woke up, been up for a bit in prayer, but I woke up to get up, and when I thought it was a good time to get up, I, I could tell it was getting light. I looked at my clock, and it said 555, 555, digital 555. I thought, well, that's a good number. I, I'd like, I need triple grace right now. I want that. Later on that day, I read an email that after we'd had our dinner, I was sitting, getting quiet in my office before the service started, and uh, I read this email that Rosie had sent that she had saw the number 5-5. Five, five. I thought, well, that's cool. That's three five, five fives. And then I go to get up, and I look at my phone, and there it says 5-5-5, five, 5-55 five, 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 five p.m. I go, well, I'll take that. That's eight fives, which, you know, again, numbers can mean something. They can also not get caught up in too much of it. But all of a sudden, that's eight fives. That's new beginnings. The next morning, yeah, I know, we're, and we're in this. Next morning, Rosie sends me this word. I woke up, and the Lord said, you complete me. And I know what complete means. That's what perfection means. It means completion. It means you've come into the full maturity. For us... It's, rep, it's restoration in many ways. Because we're in a, we're, we, were, we were flawed into the fall of creation, so we have to be restored into the restoration of Jesus. And so all of a sudden, we're just going, whoa, we're here, we're here, we're here. And in Galatians, I'm going to use one verse because I don't want to take up too much time, and there's one other verse I do need us to see. This is all in the Bible. What I'm talking about is all in the Bible. But it comes under the category of the word of righteousness. And most of us and most of the church are, want to, are drinkers of milk, called the, the milk of the word. And that's found in Hebrews chapter 5 and illustrated in chapter 6. And maybe we'll start there next week. But the milk of the word, which is to, be, is to cause us to grow up, but we can neglect growing up and have to repeat the word of the milk. And so we're always having to be reaffirmed of things that ought not to have to be reaffirmed. Yes, they're warred against. Yes, if you have faith, it will be warred against. Yes, rejection is part of persecution, which is all part of those who are marked for the kingdom. Yes, we have a kingdom of uh, persecution or kingdom of tribulation and and there's tribulation kingdom and patience they're sandwiched it's just all that but we're not meant to be going succumbing to it somebody help me somebody make me feel like i'm loved and it's like baby meh meh what's wrong i don't know meh I, let's see can i check your diaper Oh, no, you're clean. You're, you're dry. You're hungry. Nah. A baby, you have to try to guess what they need. And then you try to give them. And most of the time, have you ever, what's the third reason kids go, nah? They're tired. Do you need to rest? No, I don't. <laughs> you're hungry. No, I'm not. And so we just stir ourselves up in adrenaline. Have you ever watched kids rise up in adrenaline? If you haven't, your uncle, your, your, your kid's uncle will do it for you. Stir them up. And that's about how most Christians do anything around here in the earth today. Just got to get all stirred up. But the flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. When you're stirred up, you're in the soul. Because your soul is in your blood. It's your identity of who you are, who I am. It's why we know the world so well and we are aware of what's going on around us so clearly because it's in us. We are that being. That soul will be so saved into full entirety and one day we'll have the life-giving spirit 
And we'll have a soul that's been so redeemed, it will not be in blood, but it will be in spirit. Like Papa. Papa has a soul. But his soul isn't in the blood, right? He's a spirit. So there's, a, there's this massive change that's available to us and to press into. But we're not always uh, willing. And, and Hebrews 5 talks about that. So in Galatians chapter 5, one verse, or because I wanted to do 16 verses, but that'll take up all the time. So, But the first 16 are where I would have been. But I want to read one um, verse 4 through 6, just two, three verses. For you have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. So as a living believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, if I begin to put my faith in actions and works and law, Jesus and I, we don't have the same fellowship we could have or would have because we are parting from grace. We fall from it. And then it says, we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Now pause and listen to this, beloved. I know that righteousness is given to me because I believe. But here it says, through Holy Spirit, I'm eagerly waiting for the hope of righteousness by faith. So what has been imputed to me is yet to be fully realized in me. There's more to the hope of of the righteousness by faith than what I'm enjoying. There's more to salvation than what I'm experiencing. There's more to the in Christ truth of life that I'm carrying. Did every one of us are called to have a confession of faith? Actually, no, it's not. It's a confession of hope, according to Hebrews. And we're to hold it fast. And that hope is that when we felt the Lord speak. That's in the scripture, when he comes alive. And that hope, he says, I, listen, I need you to hold fast your hope, confession of hope, firm to the end. I, I want to see it at the end like I began it. And then and know this, that I'm faithful who promised. I'm faithful. But you see, we sing faithful like, faithful like, uh, you know, it's, it just returns to the, back to the milk, back to the milk, back to the milk, back to the milk. So he's saying, no, 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 no. We're supposed to go on to maturity, into perfection. But then he says in the next verse, for in Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. So whether you are, uh, 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 were in Israeli Jewish and you became a believer in Messiah and you continued to uh, enjoy the feast and all of the parts that were fulfilled and brought forth in Jesus, that's one thing. But if you were, say, a Gentile and you weren't circumcised, that was a mark of, that you hadn't even been in knowledge of the old covenant. And, but now you don't need to be because you're already in Christ and the fulfillment of every promise ever made was in Christ. And so either, neither, it doesn't matter what matters matters faith working through love so love is the core of what will distinguish us in the last days as a body of the believers is that we have love for one another that we're abiding in the love of Jesus now abiding in the love of Jesus is impossible through your soul and your senses you must believe that God has accepted us or has received me into Christ, and because I'm in Christ, I'm loved. I'm not loved because I'm loved. Like, oh, Steve, you're wonderful. No, Steve is not wonderful. Nor are you, nor any of us. We're renegades. We're rebellious. And if it were not, but God has altered his relationship with humanity by saying, I will now love every, I will receive every member of the, of the human race who will believe on my son, that I killed him for their sin and raised him from the dead so they could be justified. And if they will believe that simple truth and live there, I will li- have a relationship with them. And they're going to have a big learning curve. There's a lot of mistakes, a lot of failures, a lot of betrayals. All the humanity will keep being humanity. But beyond that, above that, I have a place that I get to know them. And I'm going to bring them into who I am. I'll make promises. They'll learn a language of heaven, which will be their confession of hope. So there are things as we grow up, we don't have to ask God again and again. Do you really mean that? 
Even the songs we sing so often, they're great to try to stir us up, but they're not, they're not building us up from our most holy faith. So this, this thing, you ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Truth is key. If we're not truth seekers, truth lovers, if we don't abide in the word, if you don't read your Bible, you will not know the truth. And if, and if you go to other sources to get the truth, that may not be a really good idea right now. Because in the last days, men will heap up for themselves having itching ears, teachers, just to try to f- fulfill their fancies. And the spirit of delusion will get stronger and stronger because as the sons of darkness grow, they're going to they're gonna say, we don't want that kind of truth. We don't accept that. We don't need the Bible. We're, we're in this own special place. And they'll just be swept into, the, into lawlessness and, and disobedience. But now look at uh, Ephesians. We'll close with this. I know I should already close. I am so blessed because in this house, we did the work, uh, intercession workshop. And it's like the, these seasoned and young they don't have to, you don't have to be old to be good at intercession. In fact, you've got to be young in your heart if you're ever going to be good. You have to always be young. You can never get old. And you can be young and really strong in the intercession because you've just all of a sudden stepped into the Father's heart. We're, we're sitting in these... We're, I'm sitting, I feel like I'm being invited into somebody's bedchamber of how God brings forth life into the earth through the intimacy of those who value him more than anything and are willing to give up their life that he might have his way. And I'm listening to stories one after another and I'm just going, whoa, Jesus, I just want you to have your inheritance. I want you to. I want, I have an inheritance. We only have this, it's just so huge. And you get in those moments, and that's part of what's happening. And last week, I said, okay, we got to get in the spirit. Let me see if I can get us all to practice that idea. Whoops. And I don't know if I did a very good job or not, but I was thinking about it. John was in the spirit on the Isle of Patmos on the Lord's Day. So if, you, if he had to be in the spirit in order for God to get his attention, to give him the revelation, or Jesus to get his attention, so Jesus could give the revelation the Father had given him. Listen to it. Father gave Jesus a revelation, and Jesus sends his angel to give it to John so the church can see what's coming. It's all in chapter 1. And John has to be in the spirit so that he's called in to turn from where he's looking at, to turn to who he's hearing, to begin to see the glorified Christ, to get the seven letters for the seven churches, and then go into the throne room where there the revelation of the, the God the Father gave Jesus Christ begins to be unfolded. Now, if he had to be in the Spirit to get it, I, I just have an idea that i got to be in the Spirit to receive it. I'm going to have to practice being in the Spirit, which is not being in the flesh. So what's being in the spirit? Not in the flesh. What's being in the flesh? Grumpy, frumpy, tired, opinionated, angry. Everything and anything that's not beautiful. Of love, of mercy, of healing. So here is this moment that we're in. I don't think it'll take God long when he gets going, and I think we just want to be on the right side when he gets going. You do not want to be lollygagging around, playing with yourself, trying to have a better life, when all of a sudden Jesus says, hey, everybody, behold, the bridegroom cometh. The matured ones will trim their lamps, rise up, and it will open the door. Come on in. I've been waiting. This is, ho, and just say, sit down. I want to do something for you now. I want to serve you. Others will be not even aware of what's happening. Be overwhelmed in the world. This triumphant bride. This triumphant bride. This triumphant, glorious, victorious. Now, I've been beat up, swallowed up, kicked around by this triumphant bride when it's not so triumphant. We all have. There's only three things that will happen. I heard Bob Mumford share this 
recently on a podcast shared with me by Larry. Three things are going to happen to every one of us in which all of us have to find Jesus in all three of them. You, will not mis- you cannot escape it, but it will happen. But it's not about that it happened. It's that you find Jesus in it. The first is we will all experience betrayal. We will all put our heart into something, trust someone, give away. And I'd like to say we will all experience these many times. Because I don't have, betrayal is always present because it's how the life of Christ is brought into our life through the death that that brings. So, so when that betrayal, it's like, oh, I've got to find you. Jesus, what does that happen? How did that happen? What did I do? Why did they do that? What could we have done? I'll go use the law. From now on, I will make myself so safe that no one will ever be able to betray me, betray me again because I will not trust anyone. Now, that doesn't work. But it, it, is, it is an option, and we practice that one. We tried that. I'm going to come up with so many laws that you've got to fulfill all of these before you can have my heart. No. But it, it may be. Second thing he said, we're all going to experience dumb choices. We're just going to make some dumb choices. We're just going to, pfft, whoa, I really thought I was doing a good job right there. Now I realize I wasn't. Okay, what do I do? Jesus, I need you to come into this. I need to yield my life to you. I need you to reign here. I need you to rule in the midst of here. I want you to be my Lord. I need righteousness, peace, and joy. I need to celebrate. I need to forgive. I need to release. Forgive, forgive. Everything's forgiveness in the kingdom. Everything is forgiveness. And so the third thing we'll all experience is failure. Flat out failure. Wasn't, wasn't there was a bad choice. It just didn't work. So, so all of this is happening to all of us. And we're going around trying to tell everybody, you're wonderful, you're beautiful, and wonderful things are coming. Everybody's going to be famous and rich and, of course, have their own ministry label or whatever. You're going to, and that's just flesh. It's just flesh. It's just appealing. You see, I, I, I love the world. My flesh loves the world. And I want that. I, I tried to make a deal. I had an idea that I could be not an enmity with the world, but neither would I be its friend, but, but it would give me my benefits that I needed. And I would, I would be passionate about the Lord. You can't do both. And we get a choice. And we've had such a beautiful time in America. 70 years of uninterrupted prosperity to which we just kind of moved a little further from the gold standard, a little further from the gold standard, a little further, changed the little rules, made things not so hard, made it easier. We, in fact, decided, let's just go get the world to come to us, so we've got to be like the world, so they'll want to come to us. Let's go and be the world in a worldly, attractive way. Make us sensitive to the seekers. We've done all that. I did it all. I tried it. I was ambitious, 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 ambitious. So all of that's happening. All that's continued. And meanwhile, the Lord just saying, you know, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to do something huge. So I was like 19, 2000, 2000 and um, probably, I don't know, 10. Another old saint called me on the phone. And he said, I had a vision of you. I said, he said, I, I dream. I said, I saw you standing before a large crowd of people, large, large group of people. But it, weren't, it wasn't evangelism. It, wasn't a, it was you were calling forth Christ in the church to come forth. You were calling forth the church to have Christ come forth in it, to be revealed in the church. Just about that time, I read an old thing from the Latter Rain Movement that was a prophecy that spoke of that Jesus, before Jesus appears for the church, he's going to appear in the church. He's going to be seen amongst us, in us. And it'll be said of us, if you've seen us, you've seen Jesus. Now, me living my life through all of the things, you know, uh, all the sheep bites I've had, it's, you, I'm just, come on. Oh, that'll, be a, that'll be the day. I remember the Lord said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to glorify my church. I'm going to bring her from fear and competition into f- love and completion. And I thought, 
have you looked at your church lately? Have you had any idea what people are working from? They're fearful. They're angry. They're antagonistic. They're, they want this. They want that. They're... He said, I know, but I'm just telling you, I'm going to do this. If I'm not asking you to agree with me, I'm going to do it. I'm informing you so you can get ready because it's going to happen. And then about a Sunday two later, um, I heard myself say, the Lord... You, we thank you for making us a victorious, glorious church. A glorious, victorious church. And it was like those words came out of my mouth, and I go, oh, I don't believe that. But I said it. So I said it by the Spirit without my brain stopping it. But then once I heard what I said, a victorious, glorious church, come on. I knew too much of the back, back room workings. How are we going to be victorious? It was there, and next thing you know, next time I pray, I get in the Spirit, I say it again. And I say it again. Until after a while, I'm going, wow, I guess we're going to become a victorious, glorious church. God's going to make us glorious and victorious. Hallelujah. Well, that's good. And then, a few weeks, months later, I heard the Lord say, I'm preparing a triumphant, my triumphant overcoming bride. My triumphant overcoming bride. Now, understand, none of the things that I'm speaking of are measured by worldly measurements. You cannot measure the world. That's why we often got so mixed up, because we just think that outward appearance is a sign of eternal acceptance. So the more I'm accepted eternally, the more outside is going to be working, where it's opposite many times in the kingdom. The more God's doing a work inside, the more your outside is being warred against to try to take your eyes off of the truth. So then I'm going, okay, we're going to be a, a, a tri- overcoming triumphant bride, an overcoming triumphant bride, which is all that Revelation is about. Overcomers, 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 overcomers. So all of us who are undergoing something are going to soon come over to something. So then... 2019, January, the Lord says, I want you to pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit like you prayed for rain. I, I taught you how to pray for rain. I want you to pray for the Holy Spirit. I want you to pray for the Holy Spirit. I want you to pray for him to come and pour out like rain. So I started doing that. And then I said, again, you should, when you pray, you will get into the Spirit, and sooner or later you'll prophesy far beyond your ability to believe or... Is that possible? I said, Lord... We are doing a water baptism, right? A water baptism. We're just, Lord, I thank you right now that you are bringing the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the history of the world. I thought, <laughs> but again, it registered. Could you imagine John after he finished writing the book of Revelation? And he's still looking at the same island, same prison rock, same circumstances. You see, never judge your world by your circumstance. Judge it by the truth of God's word. And if he speaks, then that's the confession of my hope. And that's what he wants to fellowship with me. And when my life is falling apart, he doesn't want me to say, if my life is falling apart, does that mean you're not really doing what you're going to say? Of course it means whatever he said, he will do. It just means there's war for, warfare against me staying in agreement, having hope. Oh, things are coming. They're getting good. They're wonderful. So... Here's the last verse, and then, oh, I'm just so sorry for taking so long. Let me see. I won't do that. We'll do it. We'll start up next week. Praise you, Jesus. Let's stand together. Holy Spirit. The scripture, uh, Lord, I'm going to ask you that you would give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you, Father. I'm asking you, we're a living church. We are a living church, living members of the body. We ask you, give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. The knowledge is the full recognition, the full... I, it's like, I know you anywhere, God. I know you. And now, I want you to open the eyes of our understanding, our deep thought. Some translation, the eyes of our heart. I want my heart to see. It sees in vision. It sees in images. I want to see with my heart. Open my heart to see. Open my heart to see. Open my heart. You repeat it. For, if you want it, 
Say it. You open my heart to see. Open my heart to see. Open my heart to see. Whoa. Whoa. I want to see what is the hope of your calling in the saints. Whoa, that's not even about me and me and me and me and my, my, me. It's about Father has a hope inside a calling inside the living church that he's waiting for. A bride that he's going to marry to his son, a house that he's going to dwell in, a family that he's father over, and a bride that he will commence. Praise you. Eyes of my understanding open. I want to see. I want to know. Papa, what's your hope in me? What's your hope in us? Because there's not a bunch of hopes. There's only one hope of our calling. So we're all going to be called together, and we're all going to become one, and we're all going to enter into the hope of that calling, and we're going to come over the threshold, and we're going to fulfill everything that God's word spoken by, by might, nor by power, but Holy Spirit and truth. Now listen to this. And God, Father, that you would open the eyes of my understanding to know what is. I want to see it. What is the exceeding riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints? It's not, it's not my inheritance. He's, it's his inheritance. It's what he saw in his son when he, when he put him on the cross and rose, rose, rose him from the dead and made promise all through the ages through the prophets and now speaking through Jesus. He said, I want you to know that I have much more that I want to fulfill and see and be and let it, let it be, let it be. Now, the third thing he says, I want your eyes of understanding to be enlightened so that you can know what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. These are covenant truths that are mine, yours, ours, and must be appropriated at the end of the age for us to grow up to be the full grain, for the wheat to harvest, to be a lot of to look like Jesus, to be conformed into the likeness of his son. And so I release over us today truth in the word brought into our heart, fellowshiped with God the Father concerning his son and in the son with the Father. I re release us to get out of this world that we're not of but to be sanctified in the truth, to be a part of the, the place that we were prepared to enter into at the right hand of God. I loose off of you all shame, blame, all con hopes that the world will finally work right, and then once it finally works right, you'll feel much better. No, it's a lie. The world will never make us feel good. Only Jesus Christ and what he's done, and it's already been done, and all we have to do is enter in. I bless us with submission to the truth, to the truth, to the truth. I want to say my world took a dramatic catapult into the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ when one day it dawned on me that unless Jesus changes my circumstances, they'll never change. To which I then concluded, and this was that true humility, true humility is the submission or dependency or recognition on the supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ, all sufficiency. In other words, I don't have to try to change any of this stuff out here. I'm just going to depend on Jesus to be the one changing everything as he chooses them to be changed. So now I learned to pray with Jesus, not to Jesus or tell him what to do. I'm less, Lord, what are you doing? And he's maturing the living body. He's maturing the living body. So what we'll do, I, this is what I've been doing for, you use your mouth to praise him for the truths that are in the word, not trying to perform them, but acknowledge them, accept them. This is true. 
God has a glorious, victorious church, an overcoming, triumphant bride. He will be glorified in the body. We will come into perfection. We will enter into the fullness, the fullness of God in the Son. Whoa! Lord God, each of us living members of Jesus, all it takes to be and make sure you are Jesus, I believe you are my Savior. I call you my Lord. I'm depending on you for everything. I I yield to you everything. Lord God, Holy Spirit, move amongst us. Move in us. Take us to the Word. Change our language. Move us from babies to the Word of righteousness. Let us practice it habitually inside of the Scripture, accepting the truths until the truths begin to uphold, take hold of us, till the truths and bring us to the Lord Jesus, and Jesus makes us free in the truth. So just hold up your hand and thank Him. Thank Him. Thank Him for the transformation of the living church. Thank Him for us coming into His glory. Thank Him for His inheritance that He's given us. Thank Him. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. of every believer giving the love away freely to each other the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ being changed into his likeness his image glory to glory carrying in earthen vessels a treasure that's from God and not from us Oh, Lord. Lord, send us out with a hunger and a thirst and a desire more than anything to drink of the rivers of living water, to search your scriptures daily, to find out if these things are so, to step into truth that has just been set on the shelf, to move out of the milk of the word into the the meat of the word, to the word of righteousness. Do it, Lord. Do it, Lord. Make us hungry, Lord. Make us thirsty, Lord. Make us in, in, a, in a recognition that we are not going to die and just be a bunch of babies that have to start the whole generation with another generation because we never rose up and took the inheritance. We declare that this stop at this generation from all who are breathing. We're pressing in. Mature us. We don't want to be matured in the world. We want maturity in the living church. We want to look like Jesus, taste like Jesus, smell like Jesus, speak like Jesus, be like our Lord. Do it, Lord, in each of us. Until you are satisfied, Father. Until you have expect, expected. Until you, Jesus, and look in our face and say, I love the way you look because you look just like me. I like the way you speak because you talk just like me. I love the way you live because you live like me. I love the way you love because you're loving like me. We declare it. Break forth in us. Start with us. Start with me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Love you. Go out in the love. Join us for prayer this Wednesday. And we'll worship and altars are open, of course, to come and pray.